Hello and welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops, a former D1 Hooper and current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Omari Sanko for the second Pistons beat writer for the Detroit Free Press. And always we are blessed to be joined by our guy, Wes Davenport. And today we are even more blessed because we're bringing on one of the originals, the GOAT, the man himself from Detroit Bad Boys, Laz Jackson. I don't know what's going on with this camera. Uh, is that Megatron though, Laz? I think people will like seeing that. I think the Lions play on Saturday, so. Yeah, this, this is the infamous Megatron double teamed at the goal line. Uh, and I think he still caught it which just goes to show how ridiculous this dude was as a football player. Sometimes when I'm just in a mood to like, like I'm having a good day and I'll just like be scrolling through YouTube and I get the Calvin Johnson uh, like non-catch <laughs> against the the Bears every now and then. And uh, I'm glad you picked like a good Calvin Johnson video because like the last Calvin video I watched was like the catch that wasn't a catch. So this is some good vibes going this morning. Yeah. It's, it's sad how much memory I have of that stuff for not wanting to root for the Lions anymore. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the Pistons. Let's do that. We, we are. Laz, real quick, how's the family? How's everybody doing? How are you doing? What's, what's going on? Everyone's everyone's good. Chance just turned two. Let's go. So okay. wish, wish me luck on dealing with a two-year-old. Bryce is laughing because he knows what that's about. <laughs> um, everyone's doing good. Uh, got uh, a trip back to Michigan up to Charlevoix plan to see... Uh, some friends of mine in the next couple of weeks, which is why when Omari texted me, he was like, can you come on the show? I was like, actually, like, kind of no, unless we do it right this second. So I'm happy we were able to make this work, though. Yeah, that's what, you know, usually we record on a Sunday, whatever, but for Laz, we'll make whatever work to get you on here, have you record with us. People will be able to check it out later on, even if they're not able to join us live right now. But Omari, Laz, we we haven't talked. Cade Cunningham, U.S. Select Team, the offseason, him being healthy, we've kind of stayed away from that so far. So we're going to start with that. We'll get into Jalen Duren, Asar, all of that stuff. Obviously, getting Laz's ideas behind the Pistons offseason and where this thing stands right now is, is why he's here but let's start with Cade let's just start with the team USA scrimmages that select team what were your initial thoughts I don't know if you actually I know there's a way to go watch the full game I actually haven't I've just seen the highlights but I don't know how much you've watched Laz but what were just your thoughts either what you've watched or what you've kind of seen on social media with with his performance yeah I sat down and watched the uh the whole thing I will send it to you if you need help finding it Bryce uh yeah. it was it was really great the thing that was striking to me was that like i I know Cade six 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 seven, and like you know Cade six 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 seven, but when like Jalen Brunson and Tyrese Halliburton are trying to guard him, it's like really apparent that he's like you know four inches taller than Brunson and two inches taller than Halliburton, and you can see I know uh, Amari's talked a little bit about this, like the you can see like in the off season he's uh, Cade trying to get stronger. You could see a little bit of that as he was driving to the rim, how contact wasn't bothering him as much. I know we bemoan the lack of free throw attempts that Kate gets. You hope that strength improvements that he showed in those select practices will like lead to more free throw attempts in the regular season. Um, but it was just really striking that, like, yeah, Kate was the best or second best player on the floor. And this wasn't like a, a Rico run, right? This wasn't like one of the Stan Remy like runs in Miami. Like this is like the USA select basketball team, right? Like these dudes are fighting for a gold medal. And Kate is just like very clearly like outclassing some of these guys. So it was like, I was I was really enthused. I was really impressed. I was really I was really pleased. It's just a lot of positive thoughts and words when I watched that full uh, Kate Cunningham uh, practice. Yeah, I wrote about it earlier this week, but. Just to see the amount of attention that that performance brought, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was like a breakout for him because he still has to carry that into the regular season, but just to see how everybody immediately, like whether you're a Pistons fan or a Pistons Twitter or just a national person with no connection at all, everybody's collectively like, wow, Cade was really, really, really good. It almost felt like a, a the breakout party for him, right? Like everybody's realizing, oh, this guy's pretty good. And all of the stuff he was doing in the video, uh, you know, the stuff we saw him do in bits and pieces as a rookie, but obviously the key for him is just the night to night consistency. And, you know, of course his shin's been bothering him for a while too. So you just wonder what a healthy version of him looks like. But it's just, it's just always impressive to me how he always seems to be moving in slow motion, but 
like just the herky jerkiness of his movement and uh, just how deep his bat goes as well. I mean, he had spin moves. He just had so many different avenues to get to the rim, despite not necessarily having like the quickest first step in the world. Like it, it just makes you wonder what version of Cade we'll see next season for him to do that in, in two straight scrimmages. So that's where I'm at now. Like how much of this really teases what we'll see from Cade next season uh, from day one on. Real quick, one second, Laz. We got to shout out Omari Sankofa, the OG here. And he says, good morning, Bryce, Wes, Laz, and good morning, son. O2, your mom says she's excited about the coming season. So we had to we had to shout out the man himself, Omari Sankofa, the first um, tuning in here live with us. So thank you, Omari. We appreciate you tuning in. Shout out to that. <laughs> <laughs> to go back to Cade, I, I think what Omari mentioned too about a little bit of the of the national love, was was like it was great to hear obviously like you know it's detroit versus everybody all the time but like to get love from people is is great as well but it was really just striking how out of sight out of mind Cade was to a lot of people like he he was the number one pick like two years ago and i'm listening to podcasts and i'm reading people's offseason content and they're doing like 23 under 23 lists and he's not as high as i imagined he would be and it's and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that his last game was November 9th, right? It's been a long time since people have seen Cade Cunningham play. And so it's just like, Omari knows he's this good, right? Like, Bryce, you know he's this good. I know he's this good. But a lot of people weren't watching a 17-win team just to see like how much better the, the Cade Cunningham version of that team was, right? And so it's like, yeah, we'll we'll see a lot more attention be paid to the Pistons if Cade Cunningham is like, you know, hopefully able to stay healthy and able to make this team like really uh, improve in terms of wins and losses and in terms of watchability, right? Like Cade's a, a fun guy to watch, control the, control the pace and tempo and flow of the basketball. How much of a surprise, because it really took me aback, Laz, and I don't want to, I'm not going to call out who, the, the person that posted it on Twitter. I mean, I guess I retweeted it so you could go find it, but someone had him like six in the 2021 redraft. And I'm just like, okay, Evan Mobley, sure. A, a couple other guys, sure. But six, like we're really, and I guess what is confusing to me is it just, he hasn't been available. It's not like he, yes, there's some efficiency things, right? We can critique Cade's game, but I guess I just didn't realize people were that down on him. And I just wonder if it truly is the out of sight, out of mind. If people haven't been impressed with the 72 games he has played. I don't know. It just, it really, really surprised me that people were so forgetful of how good this dude was and then how quickly they were to jump back on the bandwagon, right? Because I was, I tweeted this out. Every podcast I turned on for the next couple of days after that scrimmage led with Cade Cunningham. And now I'm listening to people talk about, oh yeah, we're excited to watch the Pistons this year. They'll be really interesting. I'm like, really? Like, th is this really where the national media is? So I don't know, Laz. That, that, it truly, truly shocked me, you know, kind of the buzz around it. Yeah, definitely. I, I do think a lot of it is just like out of sight, out of mind. I think also what Kate's not um, like we we t I talked about like pace and tempo and flow. Kate's not Anthony Edwards, right? In which his dominance of the game is like apparent to even people who like don't know what they're watching. They're like, oh, but like I see like that guy, like he can really play. Kate's less like that. And I think that elite feel for the game is an elite skill. But when you're like re-ranking guys and you're talking about like a redraft, you're looking for like what are the elite traits that have like already been displayed. Like for Evan Mobley, that's defense, right? Like all defense in the second year, like that's crazy. Scotty Barnes, rookie of the year already. So it's like you you see why like guys would get taken above him. But also like we know Kate has an elite, we know Kate's elite skill, and it translates to what we assume will be winning basketball in the future. But he doesn't like stand out in a uh, in a like aesthetic sense I guess and along with that even just his rookie year um, you know and there was a lot of debate about where he finished in the rookie of the year race where there's a perception that maybe he got docked for having to carry a team that wasn't in a position to compete like obviously Mobley and Scotty Barnes were teams that uh, I believe both ended up making the playoffs that year and, you know, K, like maybe the efficiency wasn't quite there. But even as a rookie, I think maybe nationally people missed that 
he was doing some things that you don't see rookies do. And, you know, maybe he wasn't quite captured in the, the numbers, but just the way he took over down the stretch certain games and whatnot. I think really since day one, uh, there's probably been a disconnect between what Kate has actually done and maybe the perception of how good he is. Because I agree. I mean, I think being six in the redraft from that year is way too low when you just look at everything he's done so far. What about the intangibles as well, Laz? Because I feel like that's another thing I'm super high on. Like, I think Cade is a leader. And one thing I've always talked about is he came in and had to perform a role that none of these other dudes necessarily had to in the face of the franchise and all of that. I think that's another thing that people, it's hard to kind of value that, especially for a 17-win team, right? You know, like, who cares if Cade Cunningham is the face of the franchise for a team that only won 17 games? But when the team is good, hopefully, you know, sooner rather than later, I think that stuff is really going to translate. So I think that as well. Let's get to just the play on the court. Because what I found interesting was, you know, when, when Cade was coming in, there was talk about in a comp to Luka Doncic. And so I, I was listening to a pod and they said they almost had him playing the Luka Doncic role for the U.S. select team because that's who the U.S. actual team, whatever you want to call it, is going to play. Laz, is that who you think Kate is? You know, I, I, we don't have a whole lot more data than what we had when he was drafted, but we do have 72 games. We have this stuff. Do you think he's more the Luka Doncic? I've heard Devin Booker yesterday as I was listening to a podcast. What's, what's kind of the overall role you see for Cade? You don't have to compare it to a, a specific player. I also saw that the podcast mention of like the Luka Doncic role. Um, I think Cade is good enough that you want him on the ball often, but I think like even there's only so far, like one guy taking up like 37% usage is going to take you. And even a guy as talented as Luca. And so I don't want that for Cade. What, uh, what I've always like told my friend is that, uh, I imagine Cade is like tall, Chris Paul, right? Okay. Just like completely in control of the game for 38 minutes but doesn't need to have the ball all the time to dominate it, but is just like exerting his will on the court uh, with and without the ball in a way that just like makes you uh, reminisce about uh, like point guards of your, right? And so that, that is who I think of when I, when I watch Cade. And also like Chris Paul was like a nice athlete back in like New Orleans days, but like he never, you know, dominated like because of his athleticism, right? He was always just able to, even at his height, just like get to his spots, pick apart the defense and like get what he wanted and get good offense for the team. And I think that's like, that's part of what Cade excels at in my mind. So yeah, I'm, and uh, I'm really excited about Cade. I'm curious to see, like we have a new coaching staff. I'm curious to see how that new coaching staff who has had experience with guys like Chris Paul and Devin Booker uh, is able to leverage like Cade and Jaden in that backcourt. Um, I, I think there's some really interesting things you could do offensively with both of those guys. Uh, I know they're talking up like using like Bradley Beal more as a ski, as a screener in Phoenix after like him doing a little bit of that in Washington. It's like I think Cade with those strength improvements would be like a really interesting small small screener, um, and you could like create mismatches that way. Like getting getting Jaden Ivey on slower guys, right? Like bigger slower guys who are trying to guard Cade. Like that seems really interesting to me. So yeah, I but like tall Chris Paul is the is the comp I've given people for just like a way you dominate the game without necessarily, you know, being overtly athleticism. Uh, you dominate with your mind. And you can combine that, I guess, pure point guard approach along with the physicality too, right? And that's probably what would separate him, not just the size, but the strength he's added. You know, I know the coaching staff that actually was talking about maybe posting him up a little bit more, which we saw him do in college. And, you know, you mentioned the screening too. It just opens up, I think, more avenues to kind of utilize that size that you don't get with like a Chris Paul. So it'll be interesting to see what Monty and his staff does with Kate next season. You could probably use him in a bit of that deep book role and that Chris Paul role, right? And a lot of that just depends on who's on the court with him. If Monty Morris is on the court, then maybe he's more to Chris Paul. And you could just tell Kate, hey, you could just go out and get some buckets. Yeah, when you, when you watch Kate highlights from his rookie year, like one thing that stands out is how... Uh, how many like off ball corner threes he was shooting because they had him next to Killian like half the time. Um, and like he was good at those shots, right? You want and you want a good shooter taking, you know, open corner threes. I think there's, there's definitely something you can do with that. And it's, you can't exactly take uh, corner threes with the ball in your hands all the time either. So like I, I think there are opportunities to get Cade easier looks uh, if, if he's able to work with and without the ball. 
Where are you at with the shot, Laz? Because that's another thing. And I, I think it's fair, right? Like some people question the efficiency of Cade Cunningham. And I think it's fair. I, I always was like a guy that shot the ball really well, was really good in his freshman season, his one season at Oklahoma State. I don't think it just goes away. I I know he said that the shin injury didn't factor into that. I still think it probably did, especially the three-point shot. But who am I to question Cade Cunningham? If Cade says it, Cade says it. But I'm not overly worried about the shot, I guess is my point. Are you worried about specifically the three-point shot? Or do you think he's going to have to be like a little bit like Chris Paul, a little bit of a mid-range guy? And that's really where he operates and gets his buckets the majority of the time. And then he's just good enough from the three-point line to keep defenses honest. What, what do you think? Because you're talking about him playing off the ball as well. So do you kind of buy into the catch and shoot off ball threes and he's going to be able to knock those down at a good rate? So I, I think the I think the shin injury bothered him a little bit more than he was willing to admit. Um, I do also think that uh, he needed to tweak a shot a little bit. Shot came out like really low to his face and kind of flat at times his rookie year. I think they've adjusted that and I know it's like when when you're rehabbing, like especially like a lower half injury, like one thing you can't work on is like shot form, right? And so I, he made he made the only three I think I remember him seeing in the uh, select team scrimmage, and it looked good, right? So I do I am not overly concerned about the shot, and I do think uh, the shin injury bothered him more than he wants to admit publicly because Cade strikes me as a guy who doesn't want to make excuses, right? And so it's like he's not going to say it, but it's like yeah, the, not being able to elevate like you'd like, especially for a guy who was already shooting kind of a flat shot probably not helpful from a from a mechanics perspective. Yeah, because we saw a lot of his shots just kind of bounce off the front of the rim, I think especially early when he was getting his wind back under him. And that's one thing he worked on a lot as he was rehabbing was his shot. Um, you know, we saw him just making tweaks to his form. Uh, like a lot of times he was just working just to, they weren't even worried about bakes or misses. It was just getting more arc on it. So... You know, I mean, I don't want to say like year one coming back from his injury, we're going to see this massive increase in three point percentage, but that was a priority for him as he was rehabbing and just getting just a little bit more lift on that shot can make a massive difference for him. So that's one thing I'm curious for next season is if he can get, I think he shot what, like 31% from three as a rookie, somewhere in that range. And I think it was a little bit worse last year, but if he gets that up to like 35, 36, even 37, then I think that opens up a lot. All you really want him to be able to do is like punish teams for going under, right? Or like mm-hmm. get it to where teams feel like they can't go under and just open up more like uh, two on three or three on two. Uh, like just open up passing lanes for other guys and open up uh, cracks in the defense for him to be able to take advantage of. Yeah, that's he's got to be able to knock down a ball screen, dribble, three-pointer if they go under, like you're saying, right? Because if guys have to go over, then we I think we all believe Cade has the nuance in the ball screen to get where he wants to go. And then when he is playing off the ball, he's got to be able to knock down. I think in my mind, the thing I remember the most is him missing open catch-and-shoot shots that I felt like were huge momentum swinging shots. It, like The Pistons would run a good offensive possession which we know didn't always happen a ton in the last couple of years. And it's like, oh, it's in Cade's hands for an open catch and shoot three. And he missed it. And it was like, those are the ones I really want to see Cade knocking down. And then Kyle had the question. I think the flatness is a little bit of both, but I think Laz touched on it. There was some upper body stuff with it as, as Laz talked about. And I think it was more shown with the three point shot than even the mid range. I want to ask about this Laz, as we've talked about him playing off the ball a little bit and take that as an opportunity to talk about his playing alongside or with Jay Nivey, something we haven't seen a lot. And we'll talk specifically about Jay Nivey individually. Where are you at in that combination? How do you see it playing out? I know we don't have a lot of data, so it's all kind of speculation, but we've seen each of them play without each other. How do you think they're going to mesh together, lads? Yeah, it's it's been interesting, right? Because I, one thing I really felt like in the small sample size we saw at the beginning of the season was that Cade was trying really hard to get Jaden involved early on and to like to Cade's detriment at times. Um, and like, so I, I think more experience, more reps will just like help them work that out as to, you know, wh- how to operate when one guy's got it going and one guy doesn't, how to share, how to, how to balance that uh, offensive like balance. But I also think Jaden showed a lot of improvement as an on-ball guy 
towards the end of the season. But like with that said, I don't, I still don't think he's like a point guard point guard. I don't think, uh, I don't think I want him having the ball in his hands all the time. But like we talked a little bit about Cade operating off the ball. Like I think part of Cade being able to operate off the ball is Jaden being good on the ball, right? And so I think that those reps late in the season for Jaden were really important in making those two guys work uh, in the long term, which I think, which I think will happen. We're going to go to a short break right here, but we want to stay with this conversation. We're going to stay Cade, Jaden, and then, of course, we'll get into Jalen Duran, Asar, some of those guys in just a second. But when we come back from this break, we're going to continue to talk about Jaden Ivey on and off the ball. So stay with us. All right, we're back with segment two, and we're going to pick up where we left off with uh, the Cade Cunningham, Jaden Ivey combination. I think one thing that really stood out at the end of last season, as you mentioned earlier, Laz, was just Jaden getting better at making those reads. And I agree that maybe there's still ways he has to go to be a point guard, point guard, but just I thought he was doing a much better job of just locating shooters, you know, finding the big un- underneath and just kind of knowing what his options were. So, a lot of that to me, you know, and I'm curious if you guys agree, would just be Kate kind of finding ways to make Jaden's life easier off the ball, right? Like whether he's cutting, whether he's rotating along the perimeter. And I feel like we didn't see Kate do that as much as a rookie just because there really wasn't another backcourt partner maybe that drew that type of gravity. So I think the first two months of this upcoming season will be really fun just to see how those guys kind of mesh together and what Cade kind of identifies he needs to do just to make Jaden's life easier in that regard. Yeah, I will say, like, I've I've watched, like, a little bit of the offense that, like, Monty was running in Phoenix. And, it like, they do a lot of, like, uh, Spain pick and roll. They do a lot of, like, guard off-ball screening. And it's a lot easier to confuse the defense with that stuff if one of those guys is like an elite level shooter, like Devin Booker is, is so you got to make the defense go, Oh crap. And like over rotate and do stuff and then expose the cracks that they leave behind. So I, I do think the first two months will be like really important for them to find some of that balance. And I, but I do think that like Jaden Ivy is not Devin Booker. Right. So they're going to have to find other, they're going to have to find like different ways to get Jaden moving downhill, which is when I think he's at his best. Do you think that's better with the ball in his hands to start or better off the ball? And I know eventually he has to get the ball in his hands, but is it better like just give him the ball and run a ball screen or off a zoom action where he's getting a down screen into a DHO or Cade has attacked and kicked and Ivy has shot well enough on open catch and shoots that he is going to get a closeout, not to mention his first step is just ridiculous. So he doesn't even need that hard of a closeout. I guess my big question, lads, I I think Jaden can really thrive off the ball. Maybe it's not his ultimate ceiling, but I think if he really embraced that, I do think he's good enough. And we saw, you know, growth in the mid range. He's got to finish better at the rim. There's no doubt about that. But I do think he can really thrive off the ball with this movement and stuff like that. Do you agree? Or do you think for Jaden Ivey individually, he's actually better in a high usage ball in his hand type role? So I think in terms of like team success, it's probably better for Jaden to be off the ball a little bit more. You talked about him like coming off DHOs and stuff. It's like you run like Chicago, right? And you get Jaden like a DHO coming off to his right. And it's just like all of a sudden the defense is like, uh, we're like in big trouble because this guy's downhill immediately, like as soon as he catches the ball. I think for for Jaden, it's a tough balance, right? You're looking at uh, LaMelo Ball got $200 million this offseason. And he's a guy who like, I, I love LaMelo's game, but there were definitely points in time last season. Like, I watch a lot of the Hornets because I, I live down here in North Carolina. It was like, there's definitely times last season where you're just like, he's just shooting. Like, he just gets to do, like, whatever he wants offensively, right? And I do think, like, LaMelo's already been an all-star. Like, there, you could make a case that, like, Jaden might be better served from, like, a stats perspective, from, like, an individual accolades perspective if he had the ball in his hands all the time. But like I, I don't know if that's conducive to winning um, as much as uh, it would be him operating off the ball a little bit more. So like there, there's that balance you got to strike, right? But there's also an opportunity, right? You can, you can give Jaden the ball in like bench roll scenarios, right? Like Jaden plus like three or four other bench guys to start the second quarter type of thing. 
um, and like have him run the offense that way again, and especially like against bench lineups, like he'd be even more devastating, yes, right? Because right. like there's even fewer guys who can keep up with him athleticism. Uh, so yeah, I so like to answer your question, Bryce, like yeah, it's, it's probably more off ball than on ball, but like that doesn't mean. I want Jaden running around like 15 picks like he's Kyle Korver either because like that's not the best way to use him. Let's talk about Jalen Duran a little bit who also uh, got really strong reviews coming out of Vegas. Uh, we talked so much. I mean, it seemed like as the season went on, uh, Kate's rookie year, uh, we just talked more and more about he needs a lap threat, he needs a lap threat. Uh, you know, Marvin Bagley came into the phone and that was like a noticeable difference in just Kate's just Kate having like that outlet un- underneath really made life easier for him. And the Kate Duran combo seemed like it was pretty potent in Vegas. But along with that, we also saw Duran a-, a few plays where he just kind of found his feet under him underneath and he was just kind of moving guys out the way as like this like massive 19 year old. I don't know what to expect from Jalen Duran next season. That's where I'm at right now. I feel like we saw some stuff in summer league that we didn't expect, you know, and now you have Kate coming in and like their chemistry already seems strong. I feel like it'll be like a breakout season of sorts for Duran if he's just like feasting off of those lobs. But I'm just curious where you guys are as far as what version of Duran we'll see next season just based on what we saw in Vegas both times. I want to hear Bryce's thoughts on this for sure. But like my main thing with Duran is that like I'm I'm really happy with where he is offensively. Um, like even in the select team, right? You see him able to like slip into space and finish at the rim. Uh, Amari, you talked about like that move, uh, that move he put on Brandon Ingram, where he put Brandon Ingram in the weight room. Um, he looked a little bit of what he was able to do at Summer League, like doing some adventurous stuff with the ball in his hands. Like that's <laughs> yeah. what Summer League is for. Were you okay right? with that? Real quick, were you okay with that? Because I think some people were like, man, what is this guy doing? I'm like, we know he can catch lobs and offensive rebound. I was okay with it. Were you kind of like, nah, this is just foolish? Or were you like, yeah, this is fine? I mean, like, like I said, this is what it's what summer league is for. Okay, but like, uh, I and I understand people when when people see that Bryce, they're thinking about like Andre Drummond shooting threes <laughs> in like the regular season and how like it's like no, just like do what you're good at, right? But uh, Duran is not Andre Drummond as much as um as as similar as those guys were like at, at this point at this very early point in their careers. Um, but like I'm, I'm Duran approaches the game with a mentality that like Drummond just didn't have at this point in his career. So I'm not, I'm not worried about the offensive stuff. And like, yeah, it was, it was cool to see him <laughs> like take guys off the dribble and like shoot a mid range jumper. But, but Bryce, this is what I want to get your thoughts on with Duran. I feel like the, the real breakout for him has to come defensively. And I didn't see as much as that as I would have liked in summer league. Right. And like some of that is like, yeah, like he's out there within the two big lineup, like covering on the perimeter. And like, that's not maybe what you really want him doing during the regular season. But at the same time, like he still wasn't getting back in transition as much as I would have liked. He's still, um, you know, not playing with hands and passing lanes as much as I would have liked. So I I think he really needs to step up defensively, but like that's going to take time. But I'm curious what what you thought you saw out of him, uh, Bryce, defensively. Real quick, Amari, can you answer Jeff's question? What are you drinking this morning? Because for whatever yeah. reason, we have people calling us out on how big our cups are all the time. So this is water for me and the other one, I have coffee. Amari, what do you got this morning? I'm also drinking water. I try to drink two of those water bottles a day and I just start as soon as I wake up. So, you know, if you guys watch the pod every week, you probably see me take sips of that water bottle out drunk the pod because my voice gets dry when I talk. So I have to stay hydrated. Yeah, you got you to keep that beautiful thing uh, refreshed. So, yeah. Laz, what, what do you got this morning? We can't see you, but are you coffee this morning? Water, what you got? Coffee's done. I'm on to <laughs> water bottle number like one and a half. Let's go, man. Okay. That's a, that's a I, I, but I get like the, the, the regular plastic ones. I don't have, I'm not environmentally conscious. <laughs> I don't have the reusable three foot long water bottle like Omari got. Got you, got you. All right, so real quick, I, I sometimes forget that I don't have those scars that a lot of Pistons have. You know, you brought up Andre Drummond shooting threes. And so when I see Jalen Duran doing that stuff, I don't have those same scars and memories of guys trying to get way too creative. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, defensively, I truly think that Jalen Duran kind of holds the keys to how good this team can be this season. I think we all think we know what Kate is going to be. 
Uh, we'll talk about the veteran additions. Laz, I'm interested to see what you felt about that. Jaden, we talked about Asar is going to be a good connector piece. Obviously, we'll talk about him. But for this team to take a step defensively, I think it probably rests with Jalen Duran. And I just want to piggyback off what you said. I feel like I'm going to get some hate for this. I've said this ever since he was coming out of Memphis. I have a really hard time saying the word motor with guys. Jalen Duran is missing a little bit of something on the defensive end, whether it's motor, conditioning, whatever it is. Like it was coming out of Memphis. I think there was some of it in his rookie season. I, I want to just say it's conditioning. You know, he's a young kid. He's a big body and he just hasn't quite got there yet. But I do think things could go a little bit harder, a little bit faster at times. And the other thing, Laz Amari, maybe just mentally it's still connecting. You know, like sometimes not being able to process things because the game is so fast causes it to look like you're not quote unquote playing hard. Maybe he's still just catching up to the speed of the game right now. But overall, in general, yes, I think Jalen Duran on the defensive end is really the key to, to the ceiling of this team in a lot of ways because the defense has to get so much better for this team. And we talked about that a lot with the coaching staff last year, just the conditioning aspect of it. You know, Darren started to get a little bit more banged up as the year went on. And I talked to Richard Lewis uh, for a story, I want to say around December, uh, just because he had the long-time relationship with Dwayne Casey going back to Seattle. And also, I watched Richard Lewis with Orlando Grundo, so I just wanted to do a story on him. But um, he talked about just selling Durham, like, you got to use the hot tub every night, you got to do this and that. It's just things you have to do to prepare yourself for an 82-game season. And then, you know, I also did a story on Durham where Dwayne talked about wanting him to take cues from Bam out of bio, just as far as, I mean, I'll say he's probably one of the better conditioned players in the league, but just uh, Dwayne talked about just running 94 feet, right? Like, just getting from end to end, you know, beating everybody down the floor. Uh, offense and defense. And to me, a lot of that is just Duran has not played this much basketball, right? Like he is learning how to condition himself for an 82-game season. And I think some of that is motor-related. Like I think a lot of, you also want to see him maybe get, he goes for a lot of blocks, but he doesn't really connect on them. So, you know, maybe that's just more technique than motor. But I do think if he does get stuck that out of bio level, we'll at least see a difference as far as just him being in position to make those plays, which he isn't always in right now. The other thing I want to add to that, Omari, and those those are great points, is that he is 19, and I think he's still learning to like pick his spots when it comes to like crashing the offensive glass. And it's like I know, especially in transition D, is like he and he's so good on second jumps that you like want him attacking the glass. But if he's not getting that rebound and he's taking himself like out of the play a little bit, like that that really impacts. Uh, matchups and like getting lined up and stuff in transition and so you you want him to learn a little bit better about like when he can actually get the offensive rebound and like when he needs and, or like challenge a shot from a rear contest is like he, he can make some highlight level shots or uh, shot contests like blocks from behind on on guys driving at the rim but a big part of it is going to be like okay can i get to this shot like no like okay like let me seal a guy and then like let me get ready to run down the the floor on the other end as opposed to like, oh, let me just like jump near the rim and see what happens because I can make stuff happen. And maybe that's where some of the Andre Drummond comparison comes just because Andre's first, second, and third priority was to get that offensive rebound. And, yeah. you know, and Duran <laughs> probably isn't, Duran probably isn't as dead set as far as that, but there's probably a balance you have to find there as well, right? Like, okay, like if I cannot just immediately get like the put back, I'm just going to say, okay, we just need to get back on defense because after a while you're just playing volleyball and things just get more discombobulated, I think, as that that goes on. So it's just a lot of feel stuff, a lot of nuanced stuff. I think as a big that probably just takes a few seasons to hash out. I mean, it's probably not super uncommon. I mean, it's like Nick Clacks in a few years to kind of, figure it out. And we say that with bigs every year. Like you come in, you know, 18, 19 years old and there's just a lot of stuff that you're processing all at once. So I wouldn't be shocked if it may take until Durant's 20, 21 until he really gets to the point where he really gets the timing and nuances of the game down. Kyle's got it for sure. And the other guy I think of is uh, <laughs> is Mitchell Robinson, right? Yeah. Mitchell Robinson averaged like six fouls per 20 minutes for like the first three years of his career, right? And then you look up and it's been like four or five years and he's outplaying Jared Allen and Evan Mobley in a playoff series, right? It, it takes young bigs time. And so Jalen Duran just needs a little time. 
Yeah, I mean, and it's it's just going to. He's so young. He just needs the minutes. And he, I, I want to ask this real quick, Laz. And Amari, I want to get yours as well. Because again, you know, I've been spending a lot of time on the tractor. So I've had a lot of time to listen to podcasts. And I've some of these national podcasts are like debating who the priority big is in the organization. And I'm kind of screaming. I'm sure I look like an idiot because I'm sitting by myself on the tractor. I'm screaming, it's Jalen Duran. It's Jalen... Am, am I crazy here? Like to me, there's no question that the priority, number one priority is Jalen Duran. But some of these podcasts are talking about, you know, James Wiseman, May Starr, or Marvin Bagley. So Laz first, and then obviously Amari as well. Do you see any world where Jalen Duran isn't the number one big that's prioritized, at least for this season, you know, and, and moving forward? I definitely think Duran is the guy moving forward, but I understand the national confusion a little bit because Wiseman was starting down the stretch of games last season and they like they played two bigs at times in order to, it felt like to accommodate Wiseman and Dern was also hurt like he had like an ankle tweak if I remember correctly at the end of uh, the season and like that kept him like coming off the bench a little bit so I understand like if you're not paying super close to a, the 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 team and you're like, okay, they just traded for Wiseman and he's starting over this 19-year-old. It's like, who were they like prioritizing type of thing? But like, no, I, I think moving forward, like we we know where it's at. Like Duran is the guy that they're going to prioritize. Yeah, Duran's the guy. Uh, and I agree, I do see where the national confusion comes in that, you know, because maybe one, you know, the national audience isn't quite as tuned into the Isaiah Stewart shifting to the four and they look at him shooting 32.7% and they're like, well, clearly that didn't work. So he's a five and... That's not necessarily true. I mean, he started off hot and then kind of fell off, but they still see him playing both roles going forward. And, you know, you trade for Marvin Bagley and you give him what it was, $37.5 million off fully guaranteed. So there's a lot of moves that suggest that you're committing to, you know, three, four bigs, like long term. Of course, Isaiah got ex- extended this offseason. And I think it does make sense that, you know, maybe from a national perspective, it's like they're committing to three or four bigs at once. So, like, what's going on here? But, at the end of the day, you know, I think I think Duran is the guy, right? You know, I think a lot of the James Wiseman was just, we're not going to pay Sadiq, so we might as well get Wiseman in the system and see what he can become. Um, you know, Marvin Bagley, the, the the third, is just deaf. And then if you look at Isaiah Stewart as a four, then I think that front court makes a bit more sense. But I think long term, it is, it is J- Jalen Duran. Uh, they were absolutely thrilled to get him. At 13 last year, uh, I think if it were solely up to Troy Weaver, there's a good chance he would have went five, and they were very happy to get both him and Ivy. So, I don't, yeah, I don't really share that con- confusion either. But I understand why there is around just the league when you talk to people and listen to different podcasts. Yeah, and as Kyle said, I, I heard one the other day that was like Marvin Bagley as the four man and perhaps starting. So, real quick, Laz, before we talk about Asar Thompson, I do want to ask quickly about the Isaiah Stewart extension. It, it's just interesting to get national perspective because actually. I didn't hear a lot of critiques of the Isaiah Stewart extension. So that's what was kind of funny to me is a lot of national people thought it was just kind of fine, like no big deal. Where were you? Did it surprise you, Laz? Are you okay with it? Where are you at on the Isaiah Stewart as a foreman, the jump shot, a third big? Let's get into this before we go to break and then come back and talk us hard. Yeah, I I was a little surprised at the timing i don't know why like it was a perfectly fine time for Stu to sign an extension i just didn't expect to like wake up at like 6 30 and like have that like be on the phone um the money was good uh it's a little high right now but uh with the cap set to go up in the way that it is um that deal is probably going to be completely fine in a year or two my my judge of it is always like, do you think Stewart is tradable like on this contract two years from now? And I absolutely do. So like in that case, like the deal is fine. Um, you you also like you can't look Isaiah Stewart's agent in the eye and be like, we're going to give you the exact same amount of money or less than Marvin Bagley. It was like, as like, is my guy a, a part of your cornerstone? Is he part of your future or not? It's like, if so, like you got to give him more than Marvin Bagley at least. So yeah, I, yeah, the contract was fine. It was adequate. Play wise, I have a lot of belief in Stu. Um, I am not as big a believer in the jumper as other people are. Like, I think he can make it work, but I'm not counting on it like too heavily. 
What I am trying to count on is like a little bit of the on-ball stuff he showed or like the ability to like make plays out of the short roll or just like make good decisions out of the short roll, right? Like I think Stu has a really good basketball uh, feel and that's something that's like kind of underplayed just because like, you know, he works really hard and like he's this big, strong dude. And so like that gets overplayed as opposed to like he can think the game. And I think Stu can think the game. And I think when you have two bigs in Stu and Duran who can both think the game that like opens up a lot of creative stuff offensively that will be really interesting that I hope they are, they're able to leverage. Um, but I do, I do worry a little bit about the spacing. Like there was, I think Stu shot like 50% from three for a month. And like, that was awesome. Then he shot like 25% from three for a month. That was less awesome. And so it's like, you, it's, it was similar to what we talked about earlier with Cade, right? Like you just want teams to treat Stu like a shooter, not even so that he makes shots so that it opens up other things for offensively for the other four guys in the court. And I, I still have a little bit of doubt in my mind that we get there, but I like what he brings defensively. I like some of the stuff he showed as like a short roll guy or as like with the ball in his hands, getting downhill a little bit. And so like, I'm, I absolutely think Stu is like at the very least a rotation big for this team moving forward. And like with that in mind, like, yeah, the contract is totally fine. So it works for me. And going back to your point about feel, and maybe I, I overrate this compared to the field, but I feel like two, three times a season, we just see somebody close out on Stu and then he just has this super coordinated Euro step drive to the rim where he's finishing with the offhand. And we've seen him do that enough times to where I'm like, I feel like just overall the power forward experiment just makes sense. Like even just beyond the touch, I mean, he's always shot well from mid range. He's a solid three, like free throw shooter, but just the coordination he has, what he does drive to the rim. Like you could probably expand that and then get him to just make reads from there. And I just feel like we've seen enough flashes to where I still really do buy into his upside playing the four. I mean, he may not be quite Draymond Green, but I, I still really do believe he'll just take enough boxes, especially defensively, that it'll work long term for the team. Well, and w- lots of people have made this point, but at the end of the day, he's probably a player that's going to look better and be more valuable in the playoff setting as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I guess the counter to that is if the three pointer doesn't come around. But I think defensively, he offers a lot of value in a playoff setting. Laz, if you want to add to that after the break, we can real quick, but we do need to go to a short break right here. And then when we come back, we are going to dive into perhaps the most talked about player this offseason. We're 40 minutes in, haven't got to him yet, but that's the first round pick or one of the first round picks, Asar Thompson. We'll dive into him right after this short. All right, we are back with segment three. And, uh, you know, unless there are some uh, lingering beef stew points. You have something, Laz, real quick? No, nah, man, let's get to Asar. I'm okay. so hyped for All right. Asar. <laughs> All right. So Asar Thompson, you know, I feel like it was tough, you know, maybe for some. I know there are others who will say that, you know, they always knew. And, you know, I'll give them credit because he's been good so far. But just for him to come into summer league, and I think not only just how well-rounded his game is, but the unselfishness, right? Where, you know, he's playing early on with Jaden Ivey and Duran, and he's deferring to those guys and, you know, advisement too. And then as the week goes on and certain guys sit out, he's like, okay, now it's my turn. And you see him get way more involved as a, a scorer. I mean, I thought he didn't necessarily get like the, the accolades in summer league as far as the awards, but just as far as him being a Swiss army knife, I thought, he showed everything you could possibly want. So, Laz, I'm, I'm just curious to get your take overall on what you saw from Asar in Vegas, like what really stood out and what maybe surprised you about him as well. Yeah, Asar's play in Vegas was so validating because it was exactly the type of role you expected him to have like coming into the NBA level, and he excelled at it, right? And like that was... It was an open question, mostly because of like the competition level of OTE, right? Like I watched those playoff games, like those were those were like high level intense like games, but like the the basketball was like a little wonky. The spacing was like definitely really wonky, right? And I think people are, oh, I think people were definitely right to be concerned about like, will Asar be a shooter, a like decent enough shooter in the in the short term? to even like get on the floor. And as it turns out, like he's maybe like already their best perimeter defender. And so like, yeah, that that dude's going to play. The the level of like athlete he is um, at his size is just ridiculous. 
all those all those defensive plays he was making against Grady Dick in in the Toronto game, right? Just like being able to chase a guy like Grady around screens, uh, like just harassing him from like baseline to baseline, and then able to also like make a rotation. There was a play he made like where he was he like nailed the X out close out, like forced a really bad contested jumper from a Toronto team that was like shooting like twenty one percent from three on the game. And it's just like this guy like gets it. He gets it. And so I was just like I was I was so happy with with the SAR and what he showed. Um and then like offensively, like yeah, it's, it's gonna take like maybe he's not a knockdown shooter. But there's also like because he gets it, because he can see the ball, the game really well. Um, you definitely think like yeah, they'll be able to get him to to make it work offensively. Though you'd be able to like you know design some sets to like get him some lobs even in the half court to leverage his his athleticism that way. Um, he he did do he does have like this nasty habit of like dribbling into traffic, getting to the free throw line, kind of picking up his dribble, and then like making a good pass. But then like you kind of just did nothing for three seconds, and like they're gonna need to break him from that. But like, yeah, I was I was just super duper enthused with what I saw from Asar. Very validating because I know there were a lot of people who were like, "No, this you have to have this pick be somebody that we think is going to be good." It's like you have to take like a Taylor Hendricks or you have to take like a, a Jairus Walker. And it's just like no, like those guys. Like Walker was also pretty good in summer league, and Hendricks didn't play because of an injury, if I remember correctly. But it's just like Asar fits what this team needs in terms of defense and just like more guys who have high level feel so well, that was just like, it was extremely validating. So you always saw this role from Asar. I mean, and he, was he your number one guy throughout the process? He was the guy I preferred okay. over at, at once they like fell to five, obviously is like, I thought yeah. he was the best combination of upside and instant impact. And, uh, I, and I still do. And, uh, some really kind of bore that out. Yeah. I mean, I'll just say like, I missed the boat for a little while on him because I had pigeonholed him in. I was trying to compare him to Cam Whitmore. This was a Cam Whitmore friendly podcast, as Amari and I always like to say. And I just want to say Cam Whitmore looked really good at Summer League as well. So it's not like Amari and I were crazy about that, at least not right now with the data we have. But I was trying to pigeonhole Asar into this like off ball wing who can really score and is like, man, I don't trust any of that. And it took me a long time to see the stuff you're talking about. So you were way ahead of me and way better than me and seeing this connector. I saw the defense. I still have some concerns because there were just some bad habits, but maybe that was just the context of the play. But in terms of what he showed at Summer League, you're right. It, it was incredible. He was really good defensively offensive rebounds, all of that stuff. Obviously, he's going to be really good in transition. I'm interested to see what the half-court offense looks like. I think you can get away with just two non-shooters on the floor. So as long as that's the case, as long as he's not the third non-shooter, I think it's going to be all right. And he seems to have the feel for when do I cut? You could put him in the dunker spot, those type of things. What do you think about his ball handling, Laz? You know, we saw some of the transition stuff, right? But that's completely different than operating a ball screen in the half-court. Do you think there's real like primary creator reps in his near or distant future? Uh, it's not something I want him to like completely disregard, but it's not what I would focus on this rookie season, right? I would really just focus on getting him integrated into the offense and like getting the ball in his hands with an advantage and making good decisions because I think that's what he's good at. And I want him to succeed his rookie year, right? And I'm, if the team is going to like try and turn the corner and win games, like this is not the year for Asar to be experimenting and like running like 15 pick and rolls a game. The other part with Asar, and we talk about his shooting a lot, but him and his brother were like the guys on that team in OTE. So they were probably having to take shots that you wouldn't want them taking in the NBA. But I think it was tougher just because they were the guys to get a feel for, okay, like when there are other guys on the team who need the ball, like how do you kind of fill into that that hierarchy, right? Like, how much are you still going to try to get your own shot, this and that? And Asar didn't do that at all in Summer League. I mean, it was just totally, I'm just going to put 100% of my efforts in the defense, like, moving the ball, making those touchdown passes and transition, rebounding. His rebounding was, like, outstanding. I think just the extent that he just completely, just unselfishly 
removed himself as a, a, a scorer and deferred to those other guys. I mean, on that seems like catching a lob or, you know, like a play broke down or whatever. But I think that was the level of unselfishness. I feel like it was tougher to get a feel for in OTE. And once you see that in Summer League, it's like, okay, well, if you're going to be a non-shooter, you have to excel at everything else. And he did that, right? Like, I think that makes you feel a lot more comfortable about a guy who was a weak shooter when they're not only above average at everything else, but they also just completely embrace those roles and they're not even looking for their own shot. Because we've seen, you know, Pistons in the past, I'm not going to say any names, who were good at everything else, but they also wanted to take shots. And it's like, well, that that kind of brings the offense down when you do that. So I think Asar's himself is just, just beyond everything else really, really stood out. Yeah, and the intel around those two, that's what was hard. So I'd be interested what you thought about that, Laz, and then we'll finish up with a couple questions and maybe talk about uh, a guy you're a fan of that doesn't play for the Pistons and Damian Lillard, but the intel, Laz, around these guys. Everything I heard was they're great kids, they're the hardest workers, and then as stories continue to come out, we hear it more and more, but it's not always easy to trust that. But, I mean, it just sounds like these, both of them, even a men, and I know he plays for the Rockets, but... You know, they just are great kids that that love the game of basketball. And whenever people are talking about it, it's one thing. As we continue to see it play out on the court throughout the offseason, all of that, you really buy into who this kid is and his willingness to do all the things you guys are talking about. So, I mean, again, we, we have one extra data point of five summer league games or four summer league games, but it all looks really positive for Asar right now. It's like the 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 intel is great but you have to match the intel with production and skill like on the court. Like I could work as hard as a Sar Thompson, but like I'll never be like 6'7", 6'6", and like be able to jump like that either, right? So it's just like, be, but having that be like the total package is what made them like really, really enticing. Also like a Sar averaged like five stocks a game in Summer League, which is just like, like, I know like it's really impressive when uh like Cam Whitmore scores like twenty five a night in summer league, but like giving a crap on defense in summer league is like not something Crazy. you see every day, right? So just like I'm I'm completely sold on this guy being able to make an impact from day one. Real quick, and I ended up not tweeting it out because I thought people would be like, Oh, this doesn't matter, but Wes will know this because I was sending them to Wes. Watch a star run from the bench to check in. It stood out to me watching summer league games. And again, it seems silly, but it's summer league and he's getting his name called to go check in. And he's like sprinting up. Like he just, to me, it just was like, this guy loves the game of basketball and wants to play. And everything we've seen thus far, you know, the article that came out recently, I believe, you know, James Edwards, the third for the athletic does an amazing job was, you know, I think interviewed somebody and it was Asar was at a park, you know, getting his workout in because the gym was closed. And so he just loves hoop. Let's uh, answer this question real quick, Laz. Jason Karras, I think the Pistons will be better this year, but what do you think about the long-term success without a pure shooter in the young court? Is this something that concerns you, something that they should have prioritized by now, or is it not something you're really worried about? It's something you would like to see, but I'm not overly concerned with it right now. Uh, we had like a thing from, I believe it was Kyle Metz uh, earlier. It was just like, you can find cheap shooting or you can find the guys who can do nothing else but shoot pretty cheaply. Um, if I'm like, like OKC picked up Isaiah Joe last season for like literally nothing, right? Like this dude was at the end of Philly's bench, if I remember correctly. And he just like comes in, he shoots like 42, 43% from three, like gives OKC like a, a look offensively, a dimension that they didn't really have. And there are like four guys like that out there right now. So it's like, yeah, you can, you can find a young dude who can shoot, right? Um, I think you can find like a Landry Shamit or something like pretty, pretty, uh, pretty easily. And so I'm not, when it comes time for them to like add that element, I have faith that they will be able to do so. But like, yeah, I, I do see people's concern when they're like, this team didn't shoot that well. Uh, and they don't have anybody aside from Boyan who defenses like really, really want to pay attention to on the perimeter. Sleep is optional says they did, you know, draft Marcus Sasser in the first round as well. So, and that is a guy that... That's a good point. That's a good yeah, point. Yeah, he, he's very adamant about this, that yes, Marcus Sasser um, can shoot the ball. Um, he's a guy we've talked about that we're very excited about as well. So let's talk about those vets real quick. This is from Doug McMiniman. Doug, always appreciate you. How do you feel about the vet pickups? Um, Joe Harris, Monty Morris, those type of guys, even the vets overall on the team. You know, I, I know... There's a little bit of wonkiness depending on how you feel about Stu at the four and stuff, but just kind of the roster as a whole, Laz, to kind of finish this up before we ask you about Dame. 
Yeah, yeah. I I love the Monty Morris addition. Um, for for a young team uh, who turned the ball over a lot, having a guy who will just go out there and give you like seven assists and a turnover and a half, uh, like most nights, is going to be like so so vital. Um, and just like having it be apparent to the other young guys, like how much good things happen when you're just able to take care of the ball. I think it's going to be really beneficial. Also, like it, it pains me deeply to say this, but like Killian was not good offensively last year and replacing him or replacing those minutes with a guy in Morris who is much better offensively, uh, at least from like a shooting and scoring perspective will probably be beneficial for the team in terms of wins and losses. Right. Um, Joe Harris, I think Joe Harris is just a contract. Like Joe Harris looked absolutely shot in the playoffs. I was, uh, I, I, I understand that like maybe that was the best thing the Pistons thought they could have done with like that salary slot. Like if you really don't think you're going to get like a, an instant impact free agent, it's like, I understand like just kind of basically rolling over that money to next year. But like, yeah, I, if Joe Harris gives them anything, I will be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, and I'm curious with Joe Harris how much of that was just, you know, first year back from an injury. I think probably the most significant inju- injury he's had at this point. And, you know, the Pistons are banking on him just with better health, uh, being able to get back to where he was previously because he's only 31. So, you know, he's still got, hopefully, you know, some years ahead of him. But I think just looking at this roster depth as a whole, you know, I think the fact that whether Joe Harris has a rotation spot or not is a debate just kind of speaks to just what they've done over the last two years to just kind of round out the depth of this roster. So Joe Harris, like that'll be interesting to to me, right? I think they're going to have to make some tough choices as far as, well, if Joe Harris is in a rotation, like how many bigs can we have, right? Or, you know, if Asar is playing, can we have Joe Harris in a rotation at all? I think this training camp is going to be a lot of fun and there's going to be some interesting battles there. All right, last thing, Laz, before we let you go, let's talk about your guy, Damian Lillard, and, you know, the biggest name on the quote-unquote market right now. Are you upset at Dame? Are you upset at the Blazers? Are you telling the Heat just to put the package together? Where, Where are you at with this situation and getting Damian Lillard to a new home? So this has been so fascinating to me because like you get the like, oh, like Dame preached all this loyalty stuff and then he asked for a trade and it's like he's being hypocritical. But like Dame preached the loyalty, but he was also like, put some dudes around me, right? And like and I don't blame Joe Cronin for Masai Ujiri just being completely unwilling to like package OG Ananobi with like anything, right? But it's like they they just weren't able to put uh, a level of talent around Dame like commiserate with his talent. Um, like you add Jeremy Grant, like cool, that's one dude. But like you you look at like their their uh, their like top nine, and it's like yeah, this team is not going to compete at a high level for and, and like especially like in your conference in the West, it's so tough. So it's like Dame gave them every opportunity to you know say like hey. It's like, you say you want to build a championship contender around me. Like, cool. We have the number three pick. Like, turn this into something. They turned it into Scoot Henderson. And it's like, okay, like, they, like they're saying, they're throwing rocks and hiding their hand, right? Like, I, I got to do this. And so it's, it's an unfortunate situation. I love Dame. Um, I loved that he was, like, to God. I, I love that he was the type of guy who imagined himself being tied to one team and success in one team. Um, it pains me that he's going to go to Miami because I don't really like the Heat all that much as a <laughs> franchise. Um, and, and, you know, maybe maybe that trade doesn't happen in the way we're envisioning, right? It, it does not seem like Miami has anything that appeals to Portland. Portland already has between, like, you know, Scoot and Sharp and Simons. They already have enough guards that they don't need a Tyler Hero. And you look around the league and you're like, who else needs a Tyler Hero? And it's like, eh. Not, not everybody really needs a guy like that um, and, and is also like willing to facilitate uh, like help, right? Like sure, like OKC could do something because they have the cap space, but like OKC is on the up and up. Like why are they going to help Portland, right? Is So I, I don't know when this trade happened and I don't know how it goes down. And I do think there's a chance that like Dame gets traded like at the trade deadline and just kind of play out like this weird uh, like middle path for the first half of the season. But I will say, like, 
Scoot played like only 20 minutes of summer league, but like, dang, they're like I, I get it. Right. Like Scoot's <laughs> real good. Like I understand yeah. why they're doing this for the long-term health of their franchise, but yeah, just, it pains me to see Dame go and it pays, it pains me to see him want to go to Miami. It was curious to be, I mean, well, not really, but like when Portland drafted Scoot and, you know, there's talk of like Scoot and Dame playing together and this and that, like when they drafted Scoot, I'm like, well, clearly you just have to trade Dame now. Like what are we even doing at this point? You've got your backcourt of the future already set, like go ahead and try to maximize that value. And then of course, Dame requests to trade like a day after they extend Jeremy Grant. So it's just, you know, this is, this hasn't been a bad off season for, for Portland, but you know, it just seems like you're just kind of caught between a rock and a hard place right now, just given that Miami does not have those assets. So I am curious to see if this spills in, into the season as you are. Yeah, and I mean, at the end of the day, our guy Jeremy Grant got paid before all of this went down. So good for him. Last thing here, Laz, if you could pick one team for Damian Lillard to play on, whether it's realistic or not, outside of the Detroit Pistons, who would he get traded to? Like, who is your ideal team for him to go play for? That's a really good question. I think, like, weirdly, it's Minnesota. Okay. Uh, put him with you- Ant. Yeah, you put him with Ant, and you put him with uh, you put him with Gobert and Jalen McDaniels, like and Kyle Anderson, and Kyle Alexander Walker. Like the, Minnesota's the type of team where like they have enough offense and defense to be really interesting, and a guy like Dame would like kind of take them over the top in a way that would would make them threatening. Um, obviously, like I think you put Cat in that trade. Right. And I don't know how interested Portland would be in cat, right? If they're trying to rebuild from the ground up, like, do you want, like 27. Yeah. Do you want 27 year old cat, like taking up like $60 million with the cap? 60 million. Is, is tough. Is tough. The, well, Bryce, you're, you're holding your head. But the other thing is like, the longer we get into this, like the more guys are going to be making 60 this, million yeah. and the more it's going to be easier to swap some of these contracts. No, right? that, that's what I was going to say is like, we just have to start wrapping our head around 60, $70 million a year for guys. And it's just, it's so hard to really think about. But when you think about that, then you think about Stu making 15 million as a third big. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's pretty good. It's not too bad. So yeah. But to that point, well, I won't, yeah. So to that point, what if it's a three team, a three team trade and you route cat to OKC and then they Ooh. just send Portland some draft picks. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that. I don't know if OKC, OKC has Chet, right? So I don't know they if Chet. they will want to be interested in Cat. On the other hand, like Chet is the type of center you would want to put next to Cat. Exactly. That's right? what I was thinking, yeah. So yeah, m- maybe that could work. Maybe that could work. They got to make a move at some point. OKC's got to consolidate some things that they got 20 players and 50 draft picks and they can't keep all of that stuff. They got to do something at some point. I'm, I'm proud of myself because I was calling this out like three years ago. I was like, they <laughs> literally can't use all of these picks. You got to do something with them. But I also understand from their perspective, like, you know, why we just trade for a cat and throw like seven picks in just because we got them, right? Like we got to get something we want. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sold that Dwayne, or excuse me, Troy Weaver's waiting for OKC to cut their five dudes or wave their five dudes, and he's just going to pick up whichever one he thinks is the best from that organization. But thank you for everybody that tuned in with us this morning. I know it was kind of a weird Friday morning time. Hopefully nobody got in trouble at work tuning in, but we appreciate you guys. If you're listening and watching right now live, just keep an eye out for Sunday morning. Omari and I and Wes have something cooking, a, a nice little interview that I think you guys will be interested in. So tune into that. If you're listening after Sunday morning, make sure you go back and find that interview after after you finish, or I guess you have finished this episode with Laz. Laz, man, thank you so much. I know everybody was super excited to hear your voice. Again, I'm super jealous. Like I, my voice is not sounding good next to you and Omari. So um, yeah, I think Doug says it. Omari has the Barry White thing going. Laz is a terrific analyst. Need a nap now. So thank you, Doug. Laz, thank you, my guy. I appreciate you. No, thanks for having me on, guys. I I really appreciate it. Laz, always a pleasure having you on. Uh, My state news brother, we were the two, the only two people watching the Pistons back in like... (laughs) Us us and Josh, right? And Josh, yeah. So, um, you know, always great to chop it up with the Pistons with you. And uh, we're going to have you on again at some point because this was great. So I'll go ahead and close this out. Uh, big thanks to our audio producer, Robin Chan, our executive producer, Anjanet Delgado, and our sports editor, Kirkland Crawford. Also, big shout out to Wes, as always. And we'll talk to you all next week.